I'm Jennifer Britton, the focal point for the CARICOM Girls in ICT partnership, and I thank you for your patience in waiting for the few minutes while we got started. As you know, Fridays are very busy in everybody's life, so a lot of things happening here in Guyana, and I'm sure where you are as well. It is my pleasure to welcome you to, uh, this is our third in the series of uh, career webinar series for this year. We've had, uh, this is our fourth time of meeting, but the first one was the launch, and then we've had three, two sessions, and this is the third one. Uh, the theme for the series is empowering young women in the digital age, but we also want to assure that the information is useful for young men and boys as well. For those of you who don't know, the partnership was endorsed in 2019, and the main uh, focus of the partnership is to ensure that we contribute to making all the citizens of CARICOM digitally literate, and in particular, our focus is on women and girls, because globally, uh, the statistics show us that women are underrepresented in STEM fields, um, only about 35% of students who choose STEM-related subjects are women, and that as little as 15% of the graduates earning degrees in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics are women. So we have a lot of work to do. We don't know our regional statistics yet. By the uh, early next year, I hope that I can give you real data on what our uh, situation looks like as a region. But for now, we continue to do the groundwork to ensure that we uh, do what is necessary to help drive policy and to build the information uh, field for our learners, students, parents, guardians. And hopefully it will help all of them, all of us, explore our futures, the uh, careers that are here and those that are emerging in our excited, exciting world. So we are excited to have you today and we hope that uh, this session will provide you with valuable insights. Our moderator for today will be uh, Ms. Nicole Cole, who is a trained social worker, uh, speaks basic Spanish and Mandarin. She's pursuing anthropology and forensic science uh, learnings, and she is a lifelong learner and an active, ever-present, ever-ready member of our partnership. So I ask you to welcome her today, and she will guide us through our session as we go along this uh, for this short one-hour session today. Thank you, and over to Ms. Cole. Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to this uh, important webinar series. I am happy to be here, and uh, as the agenda, we have a slight shift in the agenda, and so uh, our first presenter will be Miss Rhonda Rosa, sorry, uh, Essine. Did I say that right? And uh, she is a 22 year old uh, Antiguan woman on a mission to break barriers in STEM and healthcare. She is a UN Youth Advisory Group member for Barbados and Eastern Caribbean and a passionate advocate for women in STEM and a dedicated medical student on a mission to make a difference in the world. Rhoda is a graduate of the University of the West mm -hmm. Indies Mona campus where she studied information technology she was an active member of the ICT committee where she contributed her technical expertise to drive innovation and digital transformation on campus. Rhoda studying information technology led to a discussion with Dr. Carleen Campbell with Digital Jamaica Future of Youth Summit, encouraging more women in STEM, women to take on STEM fields. She also participated in the Jamaica Tertiary Education Commission Forum discussion talk on core functions in higher education space. As a result of her excellent work, she received the George Allen's Hall's pinned Senator and Premier Award for Excellence in Leadership. The UWE Mona Guild Council's Exemplary Leadership and Outstanding Performance and the University of the West Indies Individual Award Certificate for Outstanding Leadership Performance. In 2022, she was awarded the recipient of the JCI Senator Clovis St. Romain Leadership Award for the Youth Empowerment Program. Outside of academia, Rhoda is a leader in her community. 
She was the distinguished president and distinguished bulletin editor for the Caribbean District Circle K International, where she harnessed the power of community and collaboration to inspire positive change. She's also a youth parliamentarian for the National Youth Parliament of Antigua and Barbuda, where she amplifies the voices of young people and advocates for policies that shape our brighter future. Welcome to the champion, the champion youth leader, women in STEM, Rhoda, it's your platform now, I thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So I like to give a very interactive um, presentation. So is everyone here? They can put like a yes in the chat or girls in STEM, like a little big up just so I can, can confirm that we're all here and you can hear me. So I see a thumbs up. You can use the chat feature, okay. I see Erica, I see Phil Mac, I see Jessica. Okay, great stuff. So <laughs> love the energy. I'd like you guys to keep it up throughout my presentation and let's get right into it. So I'll be sharing my screen. Just want to confirm that everyone can see it. Yes, okay, great stuff. So my topic today, we'll be focusing on women in STEM, of course, and this should be relevant to the guys as well. But we'll be talking about how does one narrow down a career choice? So thank you for the amazing bio earlier. And just so a little bit about, about me, as I said, I have a bachelor's of science in information technology. I'm also a freelance web developer and graphic designer. And currently I'm pursuing a doctor of medicine degree. You guys might be asking, why to switch up from like, you know, tech to medicine, but they can actually correlate. And I'm looking to one day get into digital health transformation. So, Continuing, why do we even need women in STEM in the first place, right? So, of course, diversity in innovation. So, um, can I get like a yes or no? Have you ever been in a group with different persons working? It could be at school or at work, like you're doing group work, just in general. Yes, I just, okay. One person said they're not a fan. Anyone else have ever participated in group work before? Yes, no, maybe so, yes. Okay, so I'm seeing some more yeses. But then have you ever been in a situation where someone says something and it's like, whoa, I never thought about it. And it was actually like a pretty good idea. Yes, no, maybe so. Okay, so Marissa says she had some good and bad experiences. So yeah, basically when you're in a group, someone can come up with something and it's like, okay, wow, I never really thought about this before. And that's the same thing with having diversity in um, groups. So we know that sometimes men would have more of like that leading role. And then women, we have more of that like sympathy. We're more in touch with our feelings, et cetera. You kind of want that sort of diversity on your team, right? And then also we'd want to close the gender gap, right? So reducing gender disparities in STEAM. I've been practicing to say STEAM nowadays because you know we have A and that is for our artistic persons. And that helps to achieve some sort of equity and also economic growth because we know that these careers are vital for economic development. So let's talk a little bit more about this gender gap and how we want to kind of break it. So it's time to break this whole stereotype that, you know, males are more dominant in terms of um, STEAM careers, right? Diversity leads to innovation and progress, but there's always a but. There are going to be stereotypes and biases. We also have a lack of female roles in um, these particular fields, but we can either look at this as a good thing or a bad thing. And it can be good in the sense that you are able now, this is for all the girls that are currently in STEM or thinking about pursuing STEM, to be that role model for the future girls in there and be that person that you want to see 
um, you know, happening in your teams and stuff, you're able to now take up this particular role. And, you know, as a girl, sometimes we do face work-life balances. So, you know, that's our natural monthly cards, for example. Um, it's still expected of us to produce the same amount of work that our male counterparts will be able to do. So this is something that we do face, but we could get around it, right? So let's think about how we're going to narrow down our career choice, right? So I want everyone to pause and reflect, even though you're already working in STEM or STEAM, um, what are you passionate about, right? So for me, I was passionate about designing and artistic stuff and I didn't really think about it in the tech field at the time because it's like, you know, when you hear tech, it's like coding, coding, coding. That's all there is to it, right? So sit and think about what you're passionate about. And then from there, we're going to think about like what excites us, what subjects or topics excites us. So for me, you know, when you go to the supermarket, you see like different labels of um for example, products, I used to look at that and be like, hmm, I wonder how they did it. And what could I do to produce that same logo or even make it better, right? And then we're going to consider our yeah, designs, especially newsletters, correct, Esther, and I hope I'm saying your name correctly. So that's one so consider your hobbies and your interests so for example i was so much interested in that i used to go on different um platforms and applications to figure out how am i going to be able to replicate that and of course seek mentors or role models for guidance because there are people in the field and they know what to do and they are very accessible so reach out to them and find out how and then you go and try it so the next step would be to explore the landscape so before you go into any discipline, of course, you're going to want to go and find out what it's about. You don't want to just jump in the water and drown, right? You want to make sure that you know how to swim. So we're going to go and we're going to explore like the different things that are happening in STEM. We know we have AI. Um, Anyone knows any other STEM-related field subjects? Let me see some examples in the chat. So I see graphic designing, agriculture, engineering, robotics, auto. Yes. Okay, great. So those are some examples. So first you want to go and research these different um, disciplines and see what they're about and attend workshops and seminars. So big up to the persons that are on this particular Zoom calls because this is enhancing your research, right? Finding out what it's about and how you can engage in it. You can engage in online courses. I know plenty of persons have heard of like Coursera online and that's for like you know practicing to code and stuff without actually paying to code you know just to like have a feel about it and join different clubs and organization and there are so many out there like there's no excuse to not find a club these days and maybe you can even start your own right so there's one so next we want to choose our educational pathway because at the end of the day knowledge is key i can say i want to come and be your graphic designer and i don't have anything to show that you know i actually know i do it just because i think i like it so what we're going to do is identify the different academic requirements for our chosen fields because um you know you can go to university for it uh we know for tech you can do different boot camps their online certification see what works for you and go it for me personally i attended the ue mona pick up to all the ue alumni um so that worked for me at the time if it doesn't as i said earlier there are different options you'd also want to consider different internships or co-ops or research opportunities just so that you have some experience and know how it works in the real world because we've seen many times that at school you learn one thing but then in real life it's another thing so you want to make sure you're having on-hand experience so you actually know that you kind of like what you're doing right so next, choose a support system because guys, it can get so hard, especially being a woman in STEM. There are only so many of us in the um, field. So you'd want to reach out to persons that are there, seek mentors who can offer you um, guidance and advice join um organization like women in stem network again thanks to caricom for having this series because it's really important and everyone is benefiting from it 
So what we're going to do now is, you know, we have our education, we know what we want to do, but, you know, the big picture is there that we're still going to have to navigate these gender related challenges. So how are we going to do that? We're going to address them and seek some advice on it and then tell persons about it let them know how it makes you feel and start some advocacy so like me i'm an advocate for women in stem everywhere i go i'm going to preach women in stem i'm going to encourage you etc and i did that in my own little corner and now i'm able to talk to more persons and encourage them so it starts with you and you can build it tell your friends and start your own advocacy group and that way we can help navigate the whole um, gender related challenges and also, you know, practicing balancing your career life and your personal life with some effective time management. So I'm just checking in to make sure everyone is here, everyone is following. Are we good? Yeah. Here. Okay, so I see one here. Are we good? Niall said, good. Okay, great stuff. Love that. So we're almost at the end. What we're going to do now, so we have all of this information, all the advice, all the education and stuff, but we need to pick a career because early in the chat, you guys put so many different options. What are we going to do at the end of the day? So after going through all the internships and the certification and stuff, we're going to consider our experiences and our interests. So for me, graphic designing jumped up from the very beginning. So I looked up different IT careers that I could do. And thankfully, there were many. And I chose one. I went with it. I practiced it a bit. And it was good for me at the time. So what we're going to do also is evaluate job perspective and the demand in our chosen field. So when you hear graphic designing, somebody might think, oh, I need to go work for a graphic design firm, et cetera. But then they don't forget that other persons need graphic designers, for example, a supermarket. When they have like a sale or a new product out, somebody has to design the um, poster to say, we're having a sale. Somebody needs to design something to say, this is the product, right? So don't narrow your um, different job aspects to like one field because they're different fields that would need um, your expertise, right? right and of course set short-term and long-term goals so maybe I'm going to start with my village shop and then after that I'm going to start with the supermarket that everyone in my particular parish goes to and then I'm going to go to the supermarket with um that's global etc so you know expand um your job perspective searches and set your short-term goals and long-term goals because at the end of the day we want to be the best version of ourselves and then after that, you're in the business is to continue to um, pursue excellence because you made it this far and everyone will make it that far. You're going to continue in it. Stay updated with the latest advancements in our fields because that's one thing about STEAM. There is something new happening every day. Like you think you came out with an app, tomorrow someone's going to see the fault in your app and be like, okay, I can make this better. And I mean, that's exciting because that means we're never going to get bored, right? So stay updated, attend conferences and workshops just like this. I know possibly consider advancing, do more certification. If you can get more degrees in it, go for it. Because at the end of the day, we're getting more advanced and we want to be better and just continue with it. So that is basically my presentation. I want you to thank um, thank you for joining me in supporting and celebrating women in the different STEM or STEAM fields. And I hope my presentation was able to help. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Rhoda. I think you are on, on point and on time. <laughs> I <laughs> actually uh, was very concise. So um, I think uh, for all the points you have touched, uh, those seven uh, areas, I think is very relevant, especially for uh, young people, especially young girls to see a career path. Uh, because for many of them, the challenges is what do I do and how do I do it? Okay. And so you've outlined uh, brilliantly uh, how they can uh, stay on top of things. And I believe in continuous learning, CQI, continuous quality improvement in your learning and in your field. Um, 
I know uh, the worry now for AI is um, it making you and actually doing things that you did not do. So um, that's another worry in, a, in another field of area. But um, I'd like to ask if there are anyone who has any questions at this point in time for Ms. Rhoda. Are there any questions? Yes, it was an excellent presentation. Please, uh, please put your questions in the chat or open your mic. Hello. Is there anyone? I mean, the, the presentation was really on point. One question, two questions. Okay, so I see someone that says they'd like to connect with me. Um, you can follow me on LinkedIn at my name, Rhoda Isian, and that would be the best place. So nobody has any questions? Uh, you have a, a brilliant comment here. Someone says, loved it. Reflection and introspection is indeed an important part of career searching. I would also encourage anyone looking to not leave out prayer. So um, I, I agree in that, with that too. Thank you. Okay, I see a question. How do you bridge healthcare and IT? So um, for me personally, I spoke about digital transformational health. IT is taking over everything, as we could see. And even in a hospital, you're going to have to have um, different hospital management systems. Right now, it'd be easier to, you know, walk around with a tablet around your hospital instead of having all these books and papers and writing, right? So basically achieving all the benefits of IT and applying it in different scenarios. So it's not only limited to healthcare. I personally enjoy helping persons. Um, I love being in a hospital setting, so it works for me. I brought up the example of a supermarket. It could also be an accounting agency. All these different aspects of careers need some sort of IT um, background just to help um, make their programs like more efficient, et cetera. So when you think of it from that um, perspective and just use your imagination, you'd be able to form a bridge some way, somehow. You're welcome. Okay. Uh... Thank you very much. I see a comment here. Somebody thinks that that data coding is heavy. I guess uh, perhaps it's the mathematics involved in the in the entire process. Um, but I think if you have the will and you're willing to uh, get involved, you'll eventually be able to crack the code and get it done. So uh, if there are no more questions um, for Ms. Rhoda, there's a question there. Go right ahead. So for mentors in the Caribbean, as I said, for me, I went to the UE Mona, so I would obviously reach out to like my different lecturers. Um, I started my own advocacy for women in STEM, so I could send myself my own mentor too as well. And your peers as well um, that are in the field. We have a lot of women in the Caribbean that are taking up these STEM fields. You could just reach out to them as well. Like in my presentation, is Dr. Carleen. She's doing amazing things. And the great thing is these persons are accessible, especially with technology today. It's just a simple Google search to find out where they are. Send a one email and you're connected. Uh, Ms. Rhoda, uh, my question would be, are you mentoring someone? Is there someone or a group that you are acting as a mentor? Because uh, with your uh, drive and your passion, I see you building uh, uh, a group of girls who can be uh, tech stars um, in the future. Uh, with this robotics, I know uh, here in Guyana, 
um, our girls, we, we just feel it an all girls robotics team to uh, Singapore in that challenge. So um, is there, are you doing mentorship? I thank you. So I'd say I do one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentorships. So I even started during my studies, we had like a whole mentorship program. So it started there and when I was comfortable, um, other girls would reach out to me, but I think I should pick up on your idea. And actually, you know, that's innovating right there. That's why we love group studies again and have a actual solidify mentorship program. So coming soon. <laughs> Well, thank you very much uh, for that. I see that we have uh, another question. And um, because of time, we're going to ask you, uh, Rhoda, to answer within the chat. Because someone is saying, I would like to know if there are training opportunities within STEM or CARICOM. Um, and perhaps uh, Ms. Britton can also uh, chip in on that one um, as well. I, I think there are uh, many great opportunities that, uh, that are available. Um, uh, you just have to be... Uh, researching, as you would have pointed out, and to uh, have a passion and to pursue, uh, not to give up. And so um, I'd like to thank you once again, uh, Ms. Rhoda, and uh, please uh, do answer within the chat uh, the rest of uh, questions and comments that we have coming in. Because of the time constraints, I think I'll go on to introduce, I see uh, Ms. Erica, is Erica, yeah? <laughs> Erica Simmons is uh, applauding there. And so um, I'd like to go on to now introduce our next presenter. I think this is the feature presenter. And I want to uh, ask her, well, to tell her thank you very much for acquiescing to Rhoda because of time constraints with her and she having to leave. Um, because we started a little late, um, we perhaps will end around uh, 1.15. And I hope that does not take much into your Friday afternoon. I thank you. And so our next presenter is Mrs. Erica Simmons. And uh, she's the Global Director for Technology Partnership and Enablement Service Now. Uh, Ms. Erica Simmons is a sought after public speaker on innovation, digital transformation, artificial intelligence, STEM technology and the future of work. She gained much of her experience during a successful 25 year professional career in the enterprise software technology industry. She is considered an expert on the challenges of integrating artificial intelligence in the Caribbean region, including understanding infrastructure, cultural, governmental and commercial challenges to integrating transformational technologies of the fourth and fifth industrial revolution. Mrs. Simmons is currently the Director of Technology Partnership Enablement for ServiceNow, a software as a service SaaS technology platform provider. She participates in several global technology initiatives, including being a member of the expert group, implementation of UNESCO's recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence, a member of Institute of Electrical and, and Electronics Engineer, IEEE, Planet Positive 2030 campaign, and the chairwoman of IEEE Jamaica. I welcome you, Mrs. Simmons. The floor is yours. I thank you. All right. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And also just want to give my kudos to Rhoda for her inspiring presentation. Um, I wish I had someone like that that could um, guide me when I was thinking about my career. And my talk for today, when I was thinking about what I wanted to share with you, is really to sort of highlight a unconventional technologist um, you see, when I started out and I went to college, I went to college to be a social scientist. I thought I was going to be a social worker, just like you. And uh, after I graduated, I actually went right into the technology industry. I didn't know what technology was. I had never been taught that. And because I had never been exposed to it in that way, 
It wasn't something that I even knew about. So that was 25 years ago. I'm happy now to say that I've had a successful career and my focus and my interest in technology has actually taken me all over the world. And I'm going to share my presentation with you now. Okay, let's see. Hopefully you're seeing my screen. Let's see if we can get it up. And I'm going to lower this so that it doesn't distract us. Okay. Uh-oh. Okay, so as um, the host for the webinar today said, I am a director of technology partnerships for a software as a service provider called ServiceNow. Um, the company is based in Santa Clara, California, but I am a, a global business professional, patented inventor, um, and I've had over 28 years of technology experience, specifically in software that runs businesses. Um, I'm a Jamaican, and I have sat on a number of boards, including the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, which is the largest technical professional organization. I encourage you, if you're a student, a young person, to get involved in professional organizations like the IEEE. Um, you get access to experts from around the world, and they're also mentors in there. They have a, a women's uh, group. They have a group for young people. So I can wholeheartedly say that the IEEE is a wonderful organization for students uh, to be involved in. As I said before, I'm a social scientist, um, technologist. I've had experience working in engineering and manufacturing environments. I consider myself a creative and a master relationship builder. Um, and that's probably because of my interest in social sciences and the social aspects of who we are as people. I'm currently now working at ServiceNow, but I have worked at the Caribbean Maritime University for a number of years. And that's where I had my focus really on fourth industrial revolution technologies, the future of work and really how it was gonna affect the Caribbean. And also um, became known as an expert and got an opportunity to participate in a number of artificial intelligence initiatives by UNESCO, by the UN focused on the Caribbean. I've also had the pleasure of working with the CARICOM's Girls ICT Initiative, Miss Britain. It's been my pleasure really to support uh, that initiative and to hopefully be a role model and inspire some people that may not know what they want to do when they grow up and after they graduate from college. My focus on technology has actually taken me all over the world. And I wanted to give you some examples of where I've been. Uh, the picture over here to the left. I don't know if, I, if you have any Sound of Music fans on the line here, but this is the chapel that was in the Sound of Music with Julie Andrews. It might be too old for a lot of the people on the phone, but it is actually a place um, in Austria. Salzburg as well, really cool place. It's where Salzburg is known for salt. So back in the day, it was a major salt trading capital. Been to Munich, Germany, did a wonderful segue tour of that ancient city. Las Vegas is always a place that you get to visit for conferences. Um, I had a very interesting experience in the Hague, Netherlands when I visited there working with the Siemens all electric mini car that they had. Um, Amsterdam, always fun with all the bikes. And I've also been up to Bremerhaven in the North Sea, north of Germany, close to the North Sea where they have all of the offshore wind turbines. More pictures of Bremen here. Of course, Paris is always beautiful, California. Uh, New Orleans. Uh, this picture was of me after we had a big meeting in Germany with um, a large uh, industrial manufacturer. We ha were having dinner on the Rhine here in the United States, the St. Louis Arch. And of course, um, I think this was right outside of Buckingham Palace in one of those guard, uh, guard stands. So 
My career in technology has literally taken me all over the world. It's also allowed me to meet a lot of really interesting people. Um, for example, uh, here's a past day in the life. I've had the opportunity, first of all, on the right-hand side here, to meet the former premier, um, Mr. Siaga, uh, uh, former Prime Minister Siaga here. I was uh, meeting with him when he was the Chancellor of the University of Technology and also when um, I think this is uh, the Dean of the school at the time. Back during COVID, I had the opportunity to do a presentation to the Prime Minister, the current Prime Minister of Jamaica and to talk about all the technologies that we had in the lab at the, at the university. At that time, I was working with a lot of um, additive manufacturing technologies, robotics, and automation from um, in the factory floor. So here, I'm really just trying to show the Prime Minister some of the work that the team and I did in the lab. So also taking me to meet very important people in the world. Today, though, I'm really focused on what the big deal is in our software industry now, which is generative AI. It's the technology and application of large language models now. So when you hear a lot about chat GPT and that technology, I'm really focused on working with about 850 independent software vendor partners who build applications and integration on integrations on ServiceNow SaaS platform. So a lot of what we're encouraging our partners to do is to really build on uh, Gen AI focused applications. Um, in this work with our independent software vendors, our ISV partners, I work a lot with Microsoft these days. And I'm focusing on the Microsoft Azure OpenAI system, looking at how we can engineer safety in those systems. So we talked about all of the potential harm that can ha um, happen with these large language models. I want to um, assure you that at least in Silicon Valley, they are trying to see how we prevent harm from these systems. And I have a a chart I'll show you in a minute uh, on how they're doing that. We're trying to understand the broad application and use of these generative AI models. And I want to tell you now that pretty much um, the gen AI models are going into all of the large applications um, that companies are using. So companies use uh, systems like enterprise resource planning systems to be able to manage their financial applications. They use HR applications, HR systems to manage um, you know, you, the human resources. And so what we're seeing at a pretty amazing and fast rate is that the providers of these technologies are putting Gen AI inside of the products. So in terms of looking five to 10 years out, I certainly see that there will be a, um, a huge adoption by companies, I think in the US for sure, also in the Caribbean, they will be integrating those technologies into their operations, looking for more efficiencies. And that is coming up like in um, agents, they call them bots that can help you answer questions help you to assist um, in, in your work. And so that does mean that we're gonna lose jobs and we're going to have to think about our career. So really thinking about what we're going to do in the future, um, how we're going to be operating with these technologies is really important right now. Um, I just wanted to show you this because I was just in a meeting in Microsoft. This is a little bit about how my day goes. I went to a workshop in September in Microsoft in their Mountain View office in California, which is a totally cool office. It was It's like a certified 100% um, sustainable building, solar. Um, all of the trash is, is, is recycled and reused. And so it was a really inspiring building to be in. 
healthy food, um, self-generation of, of electricity and water and things like that because they had a water collection system. But we had this workshop and it was really trying to figure out how we are going to put the Gen AI uh, technology into our risk and security uh, products. So up here, we had a workshop. We were really being really innovative. So I get a chance to be creative in my day-to-day -day job think about new ideas, think about how we want to, um, you know, go forward with our products. And so that's something that really appeals to me. I like working at the cutting edge of technology. I like being able to help define the way that these systems are working. And right now, I definitely see that opportunity available as it re relates to um, AI. I wanted to show you a little bit though. We talk a lot about the harms that are happening in AI and I wanna show you what the large providers like Microsoft are doing to be able to control the model. And these large language models are a little bit, um, they have a mind of their own in some cases. They're prone to what the industry is calling hallucinations. So, we have so what they're doing is down here in the bottom is really trying to uh, detect and assign severity scores to unsafe content. So they look at sexual content, content that talks about self harm or violence, and they give a certain score to that. Um, that score then tells the system whether or not to display that content or to keep it hidden. So, um, and, and things are, you know, even though they have this scoring system that AI model is kind of, you know, it's, um, I would say unstable in a way. And so it might blurt out things that um, are not right, even though it's been told not to do it. So what they're doing is they have the model here, they have a safety system around it, which is what the model will be able to do. And then they have to kind of put another cage around it, which um, is all of this prompt engineering. So you guys probably have heard that prompt engineering is going to be one of the big, big um, uh, careers going forward. And we're seeing it here. So there's a lot of engineering that goes into telling these large language models what they can and cannot do. And I think it's an area of opportunity for us as women as well. Because when we think about safety, uh, what I'm seeing in the industry, it's not just engineering professionals that will need to focus on this, not just the people with IT. People with social science skills, psych psychology skills will also need to come in here to help um, sort of put a bound around these systems to help think about safety in a more holistic way. I work with a lot of engineers and they're very focused on kind of like, you know, a yes or no, will the system do this or that? But when I work with them, I try to expand their thinking around things like safety. What about, you know, what about if the system does this and, and harms that person or discriminates against this group of people? So I also just all the time, uh, promote the fact that we need more diverse thoughts and uh, people with diverse uh, views and feedbacks working in AI so that when we come to engineer these systems, when we come to tell the systems what we can and cannot do, we will know and we'll have that opportunity to have a lot of diverse thoughts, men, women, people from the Caribbean, all over um, we're going to need that to ensure that we have these, these systems to be safe moving forward. This is an example of it. I, I took this from another chart that I had, but it shows that when we talk about data science, which is kind of the science be behind artificial intelligence, and when we're creating these applications like ChatGPT or the uh, any of the applications that are generating uh, pictures and generating um, being able to respond to you, when we're creating those applications, we need lots of people with various skills. So we have the data engineer that can extract the data, but we also need subject matter experts. And one of the things that I see as a trend going forward here is because the large language models are so big and hard to control, 
we're going to see the need to create smaller domain specific models, um, data that the models can use. So I talk a lot about data as being um, kind of, it's the gas that we have for AI. And I think in the Caribbean, we should be thinking about our relationship with data and, and monetizing it. Right now, a lot of people like to um, protect data and I'm an advocate for protection of information as well. I should be able to decide whether or not I want my data shared. And if I want my data shared, I should also be compensated for that. So I have been talking about us in the Caribbean, thinking about a different model for data. And if data is the fuel that fuels these systems in the future, how can we begin to get every woman, every young person, every disabled person thinking about how they create data? Because we're all creating data every minute of the day. This presentation to you is a, an expression of data that could then be categorized, that could then be used. Um, because I see a, a problem in the future if we bring systems to the Caribbean that aren't really reflective of us, think about, um, I was on a conference the other day and a radiologist talked about reading uh, x-rays of people in North America. Um, maybe in the Caribbean, we have different characteristics of you know, our x-rays. And so we really wanna see how we can create those domain specific large language models. And it's gonna take a lot of people going to take subject matter experts, uh, social scientists, psychologists, ethicists, like there's this new job too, that's an ethicist. So companies will always sort of um, focus on the whole, uh, uh, the money aspect of these systems. And so we need ethicists to come in and say, yeah, there might be a huge monetary uh opportunity here, but we don't want to do that because of these risks and these harms. So AI ethicist is a new job that just came on a, a couple of years ago, and I think it's going to be a viable job moving forward. Here's just a sample of companies. So if you're thinking about what am I going to do in the future, you have to be thinking about artificial intelligence and what's really great is that there's so many startups that are in this area. So back in the day when I came into tech, the whole thing was to get into a startup and have that startup go public so that you could go home with your riches and go home and retire and do other amazing things. And I think the opportunity is here again for young people to think about artificial intelligence, the industries that are popping up around it, and to kind of maybe even see if any of these companies here would be a viable option for you to approach. I want to just pause for a second and, and talk about an initiative that I'm working on with UNESCO. And I want you to take your phones out and please scan my QR code because I would really appreciate your feedback on a policy roadmap that we are developing for the Caribbean around artificial intelligence. All over the world, countries, municipalities are trying to see how they're going to regulate, uh, 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 promote the use of artificial intelligence. And in the Caribbean, um, we need to do that as well. So a couple of years ago, we started with a roadmap policy COVID came in, disrupted a bunch of stuff. So in 2023, we're updating our policy roadmap draft. And we have some pillars. And these pillars are really going to help our government and our leaders kind of focus in on certain areas that we need to develop policy. So I have four, four pillars that we've identified for the policy roadmap. One is around governance and transformation. And of course, all the things that we talk about safety, insurance, safety and security of these systems, making sure that the systems do no harm to humanity, making sure that we can protect the privacy and information. That's something that we need to come together as a region it's CARICOM to figure out how are we going to ensure safety and security in the age of AI. I just spoke about all these different skills, the career that you can have. 
And of course, we know that AI is going to disrupt a lot of skills. I would say that we need to be thinking about like the lowest, um, you know, dimension and try to see how we can get some collaboration and capacity building in the area. Um, we need to focus on education of the future, how are the jobs that we're going to be doing uh, in AI and, and the types of skills that we need to develop. I think AI is something like a $16 trillion opportunity between now and 2030. As developing nations, we cannot ignore the potential, the opportunity there to use AI as a lever to develop, to create resiliency in the region, to create sustainability in the region. And one of the main areas I think we can focus on there is how do we use AI in our governments to improve citizen services? Who wants to go to the tax office and waste a whole day to take care of something? Can we talk about leveraging AI to improve those services that we have to deal with on a daily basis? Industry as well will have to figure out how they're going to adapt to AI. And a couple of our important industries are, of course, tourism and travel. How will that be either disrupted or enhanced with AI? Our medical sector which we need a, a lot of improvement in our medical sector. So how can AI help there? Education sector, a lot of people are very afraid of AI and things like chat GPT coming in the classroom. But to me, chat GPT is like a tool, like when we had the calculator, there were lots of people saying that calculators should not be in the classroom. When we think about the opportunity for education, to be able to provide purpose-built education on a child level, on a person level, you know, taking into consideration your needs as a student and developing curriculum for you that helps you in the way that you learn. I don't think we can ignore that opportunity. And then this one, preservation and creativity, you all. I study a lot about these roadmaps around the world and not a lot of the roadmaps talk about preservation and creativity. So I think we have to talk about it here in the Caribbean. How are we gonna preserve our unique identity? A lot of that has to do with um, digitizing those cultural assets that we already have. So how do we go through those preservation programs and get those assets in a digital manner so that they can be used by AI. And then the other aspect of it, we're such a creative people, there's lots of talk about AI cannibalizing creativity, copying creatives, being able to do what we do. So how do we address that? How do we then sort of put bounds around AI so it's it, it doesn't replace us as humans, but I think a lot of our small businesses, our orange economy businesses could definitely benefit from AI. Um, so I think we have to balance the protection and the actual usage of AI. This is our draft policy. We want your feedback as young people. This is your future. This is what we're trying to put in place for you so that you can take advantage of AI in the Caribbean. We can use it as a lever to transform ourselves, to upskill ourselves, to build resilient countries and communities, and of course, to be able to preserve our unique identity that we have. And that's all I had today. I am available on LinkedIn and I love to connect with people. I ask people to connect with me. And I have a vast network. I'm happy to make any connections to, to anyone that you see on my LinkedIn. And also here is my email address. You're more than welcome to email me. And that's what I had for today. And I'll stop if you have any questions. I saw some questions in the chat. What, what's going on in the chat? Thank you very much. Uh... Ms. Simmons, Mrs. Simmons, um, I think uh, your presentation was uh, very enlightening, um, given everything that is happening in AI. And even as you spoke um, in the chat, we had uh, a comment that says bias elimination. And um, I have been concerned that uh, 
machines are racist, racism in AI um, is it's one of the topics that I continue to uh, advocate against because um, I remember a young lady who spoke of her experience having to uh, put on a mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the not to actually joy, paint not joy like uh, uh, white. Um, it, it didn't recognize color. So um, how is it that we've gotten to this place that um, even the machines are actually um, engaged in what I would say intentional intentional bias? Um, and so a professor from uh, I think it's a uh, university in Brazil um, encouraged to say that we need more people of African descent <laughs> actually working to program uh, these AI machines that it recognizes color. I mean, um, this, this is an age whereby um, we expect persons of color to be accepted and included and to have a machine, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very quite scary. So I asked him, why should I invest in a technology that is racist? That was my question to him. Because um, if you're not going to recognize me, then I'm very scared that that, that very um, uh, product that I buy um, is biased against my investor. Well, I bought you and then you don't want me. Um, you can't recognize who I am. Um, that doesn't make sense to me. So um, as you spoke, uh, those were some of the uh, concerns. And then I had a greater concern uh, given uh, what happened here in Guyana in our Region 8. Um, we have some boys who are being left behind, and I was studying how can we use AI to bring education to them in their community. Um, it's, it's a very remote uh, community. And so um, a question that I had is whether the infrastructure to enable AI, if we need to look at that, um, to actually make it workable uh, so that they can still be um, educated and not experience learning loss. A uh, provision has been made for the girls, but um, the boys are being left behind. Those are just some of my um, initial sentiments, but um, I thank you. And uh, I want to say, um, I'm gonna try to link with you on LinkedIn and to follow you because I think um, you are a great mentor within this very field of um, artificial intelligence and technology, STEM and STEAM. And as this machine takes the world by storm, um, of course, some of us are going to be replaced by machines. It's, it's, it's kind, of, kind of a bit, uh, you know, worrying for us. But uh, nevertheless, I like to embrace um, challenges. How can we use AI to better help us to perform, uh, to help us with our uh, duties that we do? I thank you. Yeah, so I saw a question in the chat about projects around data and AI that we can engage youth on. And I think that we have to think about data. So data is something that the computer uses and we generate it every day. I think in order for AI to use data, we have to have it structured in a particular way. So we need to be looking at data preservation, data digitization projects. Um, and I will say that I think on these first generation systems that the biases and the racism is codified in the system, unfortunately, because it was the training data that they use. They use internet-based information. They use Wikipedia, Reddit, and we know that those are just uncontrolled spaces in the internet. It's wild, those types of things. So I'm kind of thinking that that's set, but the opportunity is in these domain specific models, language models. So if we want them to, if we want these AI systems to operate properly for us here in the Caribbean, then we have to start feeding that with our data and they will pay. The large companies will pay to license our specific Caribbean based information. Now think about that across all industries, healthcare based information, cultural information, creative information. How do we then create these data sets? If the data is the important thing, we have to start focusing on getting really expert at that. And maybe in the future, thinking about different ways that we monetize data. In the paper we had talked about, maybe it is we have a data bank and for every piece of data that you deposit in the bank, you get some, I don't know, percentage of I don't know, cryptocurrency or whatever. 
This is the type of thinking that we need to start talking about, like how do we change our existing relationship with data and information so that we can exploit it in the future for the benefit of our people. The education thing, it's a travesty if we do not use AI to uh, address our challenges in education in our most vulnerable people. And the infrastructure is important, access to the internet, AI will not work without the internet. We still have brown spots in the Caribbean where we don't have access to the internet. So if we want to take advantage of the, uh, the future, we will need to make sure that we are providing internet access. We will need infrastructure if we intend to create these, mo these products. So if we wanna create products specifically based on our domain and we wanna train them, in the Caribbean, meaning we don't wanna transfer our information somewhere else and, and have that training happen somewhere else. We'll need GPUs, we'll need data centers. That's probably a little bit further off. I think we can handle, let's start out with data. Let's start out with data. Let's um, understand data. Let's understand how we digitize data and how these systems use data. And I know it's a weakness for us right now, but I actually think that is a super, super area of opportunity that I hope will be a focus. And I don't think you have to have all those um, skills. You don't need a bachelor's degree to understand how to catalog data and digitize data. So I think it's a wonderful area that we can get youth and women and differently abled people uh, to start looking at it. So I hope you all will peak, I hope that piqued your interest and that we will go forth and, and try to see what we can do around this area of data and information. Uh, excellent. I, I, I'm very um, encouraged that uh, uh, we can do something. Uh, can we do it? Yes, we can. Um, I see uh, we have uh, the Dr. Desiree uh, Caesar Fox uh, Secondary School. Is there anyone uh, within that group who would like to ask Mr. Simmons a question? Uh, we have a secondary school that is on, and they're actually coming from a remote community. Um, so I'm hoping that the internet access there is good enough for them to ask us a question. Um, or, or, they type it in, or they can type it in the chat. Open or open the mic. Um, is anybody there from uh, any educator there with the audience in Dr. Dr. Fox Secondary there? I think it's Region 7. But then what's the floor is also open for any more questions. Yes, I'm seeing um, the floor is open for more questions. Uh, anyone who'd like to... Uh, ask Mrs. Simmons a question pertaining to the presentation um, that she gave, uh, safety, especially the policy that is uh, UNESCO, the one that is going to be um, impacting our lives around um, safety and security, all those um, four important areas that um, she spoke about. I just wanted to share with the educators as well that this this semester starting in um, this fall that Harvard is teaching a class that's all AI, that's all chat GPT. So we have to think about how we're gonna leverage those systems, right? Um, and I don't think we should be afraid. We should actually be very bullish about trying to use systems like chat GPT and their, pra their best practices in terms of letting the chat GPT generate a response, having the students analyze it, checking for the errors, checking for the hallucinations that might be in the text. So I want us to really look at chat GPT and systems like that as a tool that we can leverage to advance our education. Do not be afraid of it. Bring it into the classroom. Start getting the students using it. Um, start trying to see where the vulnerabilities are. Maybe we can be an expert in, in the vulnerable areas of those applications and bring that forth to you know um, the large uh, tech companies, they're not going to be able to have a, I think, a full 360 view of all of the risks in the system. So we all have to take responsibility to make sure that we are um, identifying, you know, those risks. 
um, because the risks are going to come in in the applications that are being used to help us at the at the tax office, to help us at the social security office, to help us with our health care. And we may not be able to see it because it's so embedded in the foundation. So being smart and have actually having a, a governance process around these applications that are being implemented in our industry, that is what that first principle really is about. We want this technology, but we do not want the technology that's going to harm our citizens in the region. So we need to make sure that we have a process to either evaluate these applications, especially in high risk industries like the medical sector, like potentially the energy sector. Um, th these are the types of policy recommendations that we are trying to you know, promote in, in the paper. Uh, I thank you. Um, you know, even as you spoke there, um, I'm looking at AI and human rights, um, given the fact where I sit on the two uh, constitutional human rights commissions. Um, I've had someone say to me, um, AI is making us all lazy. We're no longer critically thinking and that um, uh, students are actually cheating by using AI to do their, <laughs> to do their research. I remember having uh, a question posed to Dr. Mansing from UE. Uh, campus and you know I said I said but isn't that cheating so she said um she said yes but um let us think about it in a in a positive way um if I'm able to use uh AI technology to generate my entire thesis have I really worked for it Mrs. Simmons I thank you mm -hmm. Is that a question? Um, I, I, yeah, I think our future of work it's, is changing. Uh, it's a question. Um, uh, our future is, are, of work is here. changing. Our future of work is changing. Our relationship with education is changing. And a lot of people that work in education don't want that change. So they're not going to want that. But we have to think about where industry is going. Our education it should be really supporting where our industry is going, where the technology is going. So I think we don't have a choice. We have to start using these systems and trying to think about different ways to evaluate knowledge and understanding, you know. Um, so I don't think it's cheating. I think that this will be a way of life moving forward. And I think if we can just get on the bandwagon early, we may find some advantages. We may be able to uh, outmaneuver some of the risks that have already been identified. So AI is here. 2023 is the year of AI in terms of us tangibly seeing the application of this technology. Me in industry, I sell to large companies this software and it's going in. It's going in this year into next year because companies are looking for efficiencies. They wanna get that extra 10, 15% more savings or more revenue generation by using these these um, products. And so you're going to start seeing them more and more in your daily life if you're not seeing them already. Uh, thank you very much. And I agree. Um, the educators are very worried because just recently our uh, Vice Chancellor, Dr. Paloma Mohammed, announced that University of Guyana will be start using um, artificial intelligence. So um, the chat is already- And it's here. not even in educate, it's not even in the learning and it's teaching too. Let me, let me point that out. If we think about AI being used for um, administrative efficiencies, yes. being yes. able to have a more efficient uh, school and the way that we deal with our customers, access to information. If I need a transcript, can the AI just generate it for me? Why do I have to email and call somebody? I think that maybe is a more palpable way for us to bring AI into the education sector to work on efficiencies that we need in that sector. Learning and teaching will be a little bit trickier and, you know, for the future. And I see someone wanted to share. Yes, uh, uh, please go ahead. I think it's ARDIC. Yes. Please go ahead. Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. we can. Yes, I just ahead. wanted to say, um, even so we have addressed it um, from the education um, perspective, but even more so, we can think about um, it fields or other use cases such as in music, 
and um, AI can generate, you know, music and, and art and even in terms of modeling and sports and stuff. So then at the end of the day, the question, I mean, we still come around to the question and say, okay, if I allow AI to produce, let's say I, I am entering um, a sports um, competition or some art competition at the end of the day did I is is that really my work so at the end of the day can I can I claim and say okay I I have rights to this piece of work um even though AI assisted me in in um in building it so so there are so many use cases that we can actually come around you know even extending the 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 field of um education and when I and when, when I, I even when think I... about the field of education so we have it from the 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 um the students' perspective and also from the teachers' perspective because even so with the chat GD, um, GDP AI is able to for example identify I, I, for example give students personalized learning to say that okay if a student is is not up at a certain standard the AI can actually help the student so so. It's it's almost like um we have to do a, a balancing act. So it's it, it's a give and take. And we know that even in the education field, teachers can be so burdened with, with the um administrative task. So so even helping AI or having AI to help them in terms of how to do lesson plans, how to improve on it, and all of these other things. So I don't know. That's my two cents. Uh, thank you very much. I see, uh, is Mr. Raj, Mr. Raj Ramdas, you want to say something? Hello, Mr. Raj, uh, he put on, uh, the mic came on during the talk. Please go ahead, please. Uh, apologies, uh, Murray Road said came on an error. Thanks, but fantastic session so far. Uh, okay, um... I think uh, we have exhausted our time. I mean, uh, we would like to stay on and to continue uh, chatting about uh, all the excitement and stuff with technology. I mean, um, this morning I was a bit disheartened because um, someone used a drone and uh, that drone would have killed over 100 persons. Um, I think it's somewhere uh, on the Syrian border. It's a terrorist attack, yeah. And so um, these are some of the challenges that we have with the very technology that we're using. We hope that persons would use it for good, but um, we, we do have those minds that um, uh, use the very technology that are properly intended for good um, to actually harm others. And I think um, that's part of the governance policy with UNESCO, the first thing that they say to do no harm. And so I'm very, um, heartened by that. And so I'd like to hand over the, the mic now to uh, Miss Jennifer Britton, who will now give the vote of thanks. But I'd like to thank Miss uh, Mrs. Simmons, who I'll uh, try to connect later with you on LinkedIn and to follow you uh, for your very erudite uh, presentation. I think um, we are both uh, here in Guyana and across the Caribbean. We are more enlightened um, given what you would have shared um, with us. I'm going to tap in more to UNESCO's AI policy, and I'll try to have uh, the commissioners where I sit on both commissions uh, women and gender equality commission as well as rights of the child to uh, wrap their heads around it because I think uh, for the young people that we engage in it is something that they would want to uh, get to know and to be more um, involved in and so may God continue to richly bless you and your family I pray one love blessings Thank you. I think the moderator has done a great job in thanking uh, Erica already. I will add my voice to that and say thank you, Erica. Every time we uh, pull you in, I want to hear you for hours and hours, and I think our uh, audience reflects that as well. So thank you, and we will continue to uh, work you to the bone because you're now an, an uh, um, uh, ex officio and a uh, friend of the partnership and so we will continue to uh, move you more and more into spaces where the region can hear you and uh, glean from your vast knowledge in these areas. I thought it was a beautiful spread of careers given by both you and Ms. Essien. Unfortunately, she had to leave us but it was a whole uh, gamut of careers in a 15 minute in two 15 minute slots and so you ladies did very well. Part of our work is uh, 
to also put this on our website. So although there are a few in our room, it will go on our website within a week. And so others can come back to it, listen to it, hopefully use it in their classrooms and uh, spaces for discussion as we go along the, uh, go along the series and as we continue to uh, try to build out the CARICOM digital economy. I want to also thank our uh, moderator, who is always, as I said, present in season and out of season as soon as we ask her. I thank the participants, and we want especially to encourage persons to ask questions, continue the discussions amongst themselves, with their teachers at home, with their friends, and come back to our websites often to uh, interact with the material and also to look on link, LinkedIn and other spaces for our speakers who are uh, quite esteemed and well-established in their areas of work. We thank a lot of other people who pulled this, help us pull it together. You, we, our internal technicians, uh, our internal uh, conference services section. I thank uh, Utica who is in our um, in the ICT team who sends out a million emails every week. And we ask that you, the audience, continue to help us with sharing information and uh, sharing word on the series so that persons can enter our room every week. The series ends on November 24th. So we have a couple more weeks to go. Uh, Utica may have some tips to share in the chat and she'll do that now our website link and any other tips that she has to share will be shared in the chat. So please also keep an eye on the chat. Thank you for giving us your Friday afternoon lunch session and see us, see you back here with us next Friday at the same time for another exciting series, uh, exciting talks as part of the series for uh, this uh, first phase of our partnership series. So please keep checking our website and we will certainly be sharing flyers by uh, LinkedIn and other spaces, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, Twitter now known as X and other spaces. And I thank you again, Erica and Rhoda. I know that time is money as you're doing these interesting things. And so we thank you for giving us a whole hour of your time and more on a Friday afternoon. Much appreciated. Uh, have a good weekend all and stay safe. Thank you.